So I thought, and you will see the bibliography later, that maybe if you want to go deeper into this, and I guess we haven't discussed uh, how many units of class, how many classes could be dedicated to this, but if you want to have some theoretical background, uh, one thing that you can bring up is this um, Edward Said's book, Orientalism, and uh, I will later talk about um, ben Benedict Anderson's Legend of Communities. Uh, so both, both of them are on the bibliography. Um, and so basically, um, um, this notion of imagined or imaginative ge geography, which is very popular now, was first introduced by Said, who is a very famous uh, critic and scholar who kind of initi initiated this post-colonial post theory pretty much. Um, and talked about geography as a, pla a place as a construction. Um, and uh, what he was interested in um, also, in addition to kind of the uh, geography is imagined or imaginative, is the fact that um, geog geography can be invested with power and geography can be contested. And I think we can see with these essays um, where the authors kind of in engage in different dialogues with maybe some of the more conservative ideologies or maybe looking back at Soviet ideology um, and how they can contest all these notions of America. Um, okay, so, so I mentioned, mentioned Anderson already and his, um, he was more kind of invested in the notion of the nation as an imagined community and pretty much was writing kind of a little bit later after Said. So both of these thinkers are writing. Said's book came out in late 70s and Anderson first came out in the uh, 80s. Um, and so uh, basically what Anderson was interested in was um, how, um, again, the notion of nation can be constructed. and. The fact that um, it is not that the nations are false or um, they are not um, they, they are not real, but uh, it, it is imagined through a variety of kind of processes or actions, um, and the fact that. Um, this uh, this community kind of uh, creates a kind of network. Um, uh, basically, also uh, his his thought was that, um, especially looking back at the nation kind of notions of nation in Europe, particularly, where very often there is this notion of nation as eternal. For example, France has always been there. Uh, it is very organic, French people always existed, um, but actually um, they are created through all these processes, such as he particularly focused on print and capital and kind of industrialization and the appear appearance of newspapers and novels. And what was important um, for him especially, and I think the way that I will link it back to Said is that uh, self-definition, national self-definition occurs through opposition to other nations. So we see in the essays um, these authors, you know, or very often define themselves or can think of themselves by thinking about America as uh, something that uh, they can um, opposed to, for example, or they compare Russia to America and that creates for them some kind of personal identification. Uh, so I, I think maybe you're familiar with Said. I think uh, um, it's definitely would be useful for conflict. 
Um, and as I said, he, he was uh, very important for post-colonial uh, post criticism. Um, and what he looked at were um, primarily French uh, and British authors. Um, and he looked interestingly enough at a variety of authors. So not just novelists, but also political uh, politicians um, and journalists and people like that. And uh, of course, scientists, uh, people who are about uh, journeys. Um, and he found very similar tendency in both these authors. So the fact that in the 18th and the 19th century, they create this binary between the East uh, and the West. And they associate all these negative things, um, such as irrationality, passivity, um, uh, lack of democracy, uh, obviously later, because this continues also into the 20th century. They associate with the East and with the West, they uh, associate all the positive things, as such as progress, um, activity, de democracy, and so on. Um, so, uh, also important for him that uh, Orient is a kind of network of representations, so that it's, it's very systematic. So, um, for him, it's important that um, all this writers, even though they come from different backgrounds, uh, they even come from different <coughs> European countries, but uh, they create this Orient as a system. And again, kind of similar to Anderson, we see a similar thing where uh, for Said, he sees that um, European identity is created through opposition to the Orient. Um, and again, we can uh, go back to the, uh, to the essays, uh, which I already mentioned, where similar tendency happens. Um, okay, so, and again, bring this back to um, imaginative geography. So we saw that um, Anderson talks about uh, imagined communities, and Said kind of extends it further, where uh, where you know, whole regions can be uh, created as or imagined. And very important for him was the, the, the fact that um, this, um, th these places are imagined and very often the, the way that, I, uh, that they are imagined is um, very far from reality or it obscures the real situation. Um, maybe again something that we see here in the essays where uh, very, very often it's not the real thing but perhaps the popular culture or perhaps the stereotypes that these authors have kind of override the actual situation uh, or the, the real America that they are, they are trying to write about. Um, and uh, oh, you know we can think about maybe Again, if you teach this class, what other, uh, what, what other ideas that American students might have about different places? And very kind of readily uh, available places, maybe like Eastern Europe, what ideas would students have of Eastern Europe? Or what ideas people have of such very, now very contested places as the Middle East? So that's the way that studies um, thinking can be extended. We have this also another essay in the bibliography by him that it's called Islam Under Western Eyes, and it's more recent, but it's very appropriate in reading some of the uh, sort of the ideas of today. The notes written 20 years ago, 30 years ago now, it's pretty relevant. Oh uh, yeah, so and it's much more accessible than the book, so you can even assign it to the students. And they will, um, yeah, he pretty much published it in the Indonesian uh, journal, like in the 80s. <coughs> um, so, America is, uh, and I think Drew will talk much more about this, but um, 
for very many intellectuals, obviously, America has become recently kind of quintessential idea of the West. Um, so maybe for the 19th century, was the, uh, it was still Europe, but now America kind of takes the precedent here. Precedent here. And you very often the feelings that uh, Russian intellectuals have towards America are much stronger than, than the ones they would have towards Europe. Maybe you saw it a little bit in some of the essays, especially like the uh, Luxembourg one uh, by Kuzmin. Um, and obviously, as I see here, also very often there are these negative stereotypes. Uh, associated like lack of spirituality, which you a little bit saw in Baratinska. Uh, of course, it's, it hurts more on the, on the language level, but a lot of people have this idea that, okay, Americans are just, they, they just uh, watch movies and go to bed or something. Um, and uh, so very materialistic, anti almost anti-spiritual kind of culture. Um, uh, also, very interesting, and again, Drew will talk much more about it, the fact that um, in the last several decades there were a lot of changes in the feelings towards America, where, um, for example, in the 80s, um, there was probably still in the early 80s some uh, anti-American propaganda, but uh, all these decades, starting from the 60s, 70s, and the 80s, uh, it kind of the um, intellectuals usually romanticized America. And you saw that a little bit with high culture uh, references. Uh, and much later, the feelings started to, ch oh, oh, in the 90s, the feelings uh, kind of went to the, uh, through the roof. They were very positive, and in the late 90s, again, it became much more ambivalent. And we see this a little, we see this ambivalence in the essays, obviously. Um, okay, and so now I see the crew will continue. Okay. So, going back in time a little bit, in talking about sort of the, the Russian context of what might be useful to know if looking at these, these essays. Um, and we saw this in the essay by, by Baranitska, the one with the sort of mind and soul binary, is this trouble in defining Russia, what it is. And this is a common topic that isn't just something that the author is bringing up. So um, it's been this sort of question that people have been struggling with for, for the last couple centuries, really philosophers, uh, cultural producers, and sorts of authors, poets. And so you have the large question, you know, how is Russia different from any nation? It's the largest landmass in the world, and it's caught between Europe and Asia, and the Ural Mountains split it in half, so that's one way that people have sort of fought over the idea of, is it, is it um, looking towards Europe, or is it looking towards Asia? And that sort of has been a, an impetus for several famous essays on that, on that topic. Um, and here I just quote the idea of Russia as the unfathomable, um, this is the quote that you saw in the essay, um, that it's something that can be experienced spiritually, but not um, through rational thought. Um, and this is a, a, a famous quote that sort of runs through uh, Russian culture. So um, during the history of um, ancient Rus, uh, through the imperial period into today, there have been several sort of turns to the West. Um, one being the adoption of, of orthodoxy um, as the religion. Um, the other is um, in the 18th century, Catherine the Great turns towards the Enlightenment, adopts European institutions, um, forms of, of European knowledge, and Peter the Great, um, who adopted modern, modernized sort of Western armies, navies, and European architecture, which sort of Trans transformed the, the Russian imperial landscape throughout its history. Um, so likewise, there have been these debates about Russian history and civilization, you know, between people who thinks it, think it should be um, sort of Slavophile or, or oriented, um, or people who think that it should be 
that this influence from the West is something positive. Um, and again, when I'm, when I'm talking about the West here, this is this is Europe at this point. So this this is going from uh, really from the 18th century on um, to the 20th century. So there's some other cultural binaries that I think are more um, interesting and more applicable for this text, and namely the Soviet period. Um, one is sort of <clears throat> this idea of what the Soviet Union was and its revolution. Um, there were competing sort of theories. Was the revolution sort of the goal to be an international revolution where communism would spread throughout the 20th century and other countries would own, have their own revolutions? That's sort of the internationalist view. Or there was, and that's what Russia really had been, um, embodied in the beginning of the Soviet Union, so it embodied in the beginning of its history. And then there's the point of view that takes over in the 1930s from Stalin, which is the insular view of socialism in, in one country of that policy. <coughs> and what that really did was take advantage of this sort of division of ours versus theirs that sort of always existed in, in Russian culture um, from the smallest units of, of um, organization, from villages and people. You know, when you talk about ours and theirs, people in a village working together form a community, right? And they imagine themselves as being their own unit, right? And they sort of construct their position opposite outside villages or outside um, places. And uh, Soviet culture really became to, to embody this idea of ours versus theirs. So within the borders of the Soviet Union, you got all the different nationalities because it's a, it's a union of national republics. So you had Georgians, um, Azerbaijanis, um, Armenians, all these people with different ethnicities, but it was considered a sort of a, a workers uh, union, and theirs was the outside, the capitalist world. Um, and I think when I say ours versus their, uh, a good sort of binary would be insider, outsider. It's sort of that, that same um, idea, because you have these groups sort of organized around work groups from the small units, say a household, of people living together in a communal apartment, to a farm, to a village, or a sort of a workers collective in the same industry. <coughs> um, I just wanted to know some sort of sources of who is the they and how the they was constructed, namely anti-American sentiment in the, in the Cold War. So um, official channels of communication, such as journals, newspapers, speeches, and television, definitely constructed this idea of a Cold War enemy and, um, and you know, it's, with its own imagery, language, um, and various markers of, of what it meant to be. And I'll show you some examples of the satirical journals. Um, but at the same time, in the Soviet period, there were still cultural exchanges that were officially sponsored. So you had uh, American and European students studying in the Soviet Union throughout its history. You had authors performing abroad and coming back home. You had the import and export of various national cinemas, um, films. <coughs> Some were edited in different ways to make them uh, more ideologically correct, but you still had this circulation back and forth of, of different uh, products and people experiencing what is America or what is the West in their, in their own ways, <clears throat> rather than just what the state was saying, you know, America bad, so we need good. So here are some just examples of journals. Um, this is the satirical journal of a crocodile. Um, and so this is um, showing the U.S. Uh, Chinese relations that says anti-Soviet at the top. Uh, the What's next, the date on that? these are all taken from the seventies. So um, the Soviet Chinese relations in the seventies. Um, there's probably some things. I think this is 1978. Yeah. Right. Right. So. Um, tensions start to flare up between the two countries. So you see a lot over um, Chinese-U.S. relations. This one's for Vietnam. Uh, this is also this is '79, and the last one is for Iran. And these, all of these images I'm showing you are taken from the front page of these of these journals. Uh, within the journals themselves, you have a lot of cartoons that were sort of made fun of Soviet life. You know, people not being able to get apartments, people, you know, 
not being served the way they should and sort of the problems of Soviet life, but these are in tiny little cartoons. So this is, this is sort of the, the showcase ones um, that a lot had to do with sort of that international political situation. So these are sort of some of the official um, media that represented America. Um, at the same time, you had this other culture and the material culture that people were obsessed with, say American jeans, cigarettes, um, alcohol, different things that still made their way through to the Soviet Union, either through official means of distribution or unofficial means. Um, so one of the articles I'd like to point out in our chapters, and we have a scan for if you if you want to read it, is this idea of what's called the imaginary West. And this is something that you read about a lot in your essays, that people constructed their views of America vis-a-vis -vis, um, consumer products, um, literature, films, all of these things that were representations of the U.S. They're not constructing it through actual travel. And so what this did is this replaced um, the unattainable, tangible experience of going to America. Because for a very select few people, that was available. Um, but for 99.9% .9 of the population, you're, you're not going to, to America. So you have experience of America through these things, such as jeans, cigarettes, rock music. And um, what we have here is materialism associated with Western culture is, is not as much of an issue as you think it would be, right? Um, especially, specifically with youths who are trying to just get these things, right? They're trying to, to get a pair of jeans at all costs, spending lots of money to do it, um, buying from people on a corner of the street illegally. And you know they want those markers of of not necessarily status at this point, but just sort of to, it's a it's a sub it's a subculture sort of youth culture that's the, the cool thing to do. Um, so you have um, other unofficial forms of communication that sort of penetrate the borders of the Soviet Union that, that form um, various uh, perceptions of what America was. One was just Western radio, which existed uh, throughout the Soviet period from Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, which were stationed in Munich and Prague. And then the Baltics themselves, due to their proximity to uh, Finland, Sweden, um, were able to receive these radio transmissions if you, if you had them. So people were keeping track of things, and information was dis disseminated about you know, what else was going on outside of uh, what the state said. Um, there are all sorts of different uh, forms of um, culture that, that went around unofficially. This is a form where people would take used x-rays and they would print uh, band music on them. So, um, and this is how people would, would print records on a used x-ray. And um, so this is just one of the many unofficial forms. You have, th this one is for records. You have people who would write for themselves and distribute them outside of publishing houses. Um, and you would have people who could only publish abroad. And, um, you know, a lot of times there would be very high consequences for people distributing this because this was not official um, official forms of, of publication. So a lot of authors during this period of say the 1960s, 1970s um, are exiled for, for things like this, for publishing their works abroad. Um, and um, so I guess what Irina was talking about at the very end was sort of this idea of the euphoria of America and uh, the euphoria of capitalism that sort of existed around uh, the 1970s, 1980s, and into uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And um, what we're seeing is during this period of, say, uh, 1985 to 1991, you do have this new products that become increasingly available. You have McDonald's show up in the Soviet Union, you have Pepsi shows up in the Soviet Union. Um, these, these are officially there, not being smuggled in or anything. And um, you have more free enterprise allowed, and you have also criticism from, from state programs themselves. So the media is actually allowed to criticize its own state at this point, and, um, which is you know, a shock to people in that they can actually sort of hear that coming from their own channels. Um, the last thing I wanted to point out is that while a few of the authors are writing about visiting and traveling, to America, a few of the authors are talking about emigrating to America. They live here now. Um, intellectuals were sort of a big market, you could say, and many taught at universities. 
Um, many taught in Europe or worked in, in Europe after leaving uh, the Soviet Union. So most of our writers in this volume are born in the 1950s. They sort of grew up in their formative years in the 1970s. And I think the youngest is 1972. Uh, he's the son of a, a famous poet who was born in the 50s. And uh, there are these three waves of emigration where a large number of people leave. And uh, the one that we're looking at for this volume is uh, the 1970s and, and 1989 and 1991, when people were allowed to leave. Okay. So, um, sources in the last 10 to 20 years where we see this maybe start to be chipped away and people aren't as excited about America. Um, what you've seen in the essays is that the ideal doesn't really hold up for people who actually visit it, or the ideal of the promise of capitalism once it arrives. Um, people start to see the various inequalities that, that were produced. Um, and we're not saying that they weren't there uh, during uh, socialism, but the sort of the safety net for a lot of people was removed with, say, pensions, uh, disability, things like that. So um, there are a lot of things that voice it, that, that do voice these discontents. Um, of course, in the 1990s, the Russian economy collapses in 1998, and you have other events like Kosovo or the 2003 invasion of Iraq that were very um, divisive issues for for uh, Russians, and of course. These are uh, official positions that the state took, but also that a lot of people themselves agreed with. Um, you also have, with uh, Putin coming to power, the rise of a lot of neoconservative groups. So United Russia Party is, is his, his party. But then you also have these other fringe nationalist groups and supremacist, first supremacist groups that, that do pop up. And a lot of these are attributed to being sort of anti-foreigner, anti-American. Um, and they don't necessarily, and I almost guarantee that they don't represent the people writing this book, but it's some of the ways that Western media and, say, visitors to Russia would um, experience and sort of look at Russia and say, this is what's happening. So um, they're very visible examples, and that's, that's, why, um, that's why I mentioned them. Okay, um, I am now moving into the actual book um, and the project because it was first, uh, it started in St. Petersburg during a writer's seminar in 2003 and um, so there were kind of discussions among Dmitry Kuzmin who is one of the authors of those essays and the person who uh, wrote the introduction, Mikhail Losir. Um, uh, so Losir kind of initially had this idea of, uh, uh, of creating this collection of essays. And the interesting part is that it, it kind of created so much interest that they actually created two parallel projects where um, Many essays were published in the book, which we have now, and uh, also many essays uh, were published online. And some of the essays appear in both editions, actually, both online and online journal uh, for the American My Life, and, uh, and, and in the book. And there are some essays that, that only appear in the book or only appear in. So if we had any Russian teachers, they could <laughs> assign to read some of the essays in Russian, but we don't think we have any idea. Oh, we have one. Yeah, well, I teach Russian, but only very beginning. Yeah, very beginning, <laughs> so we <laughs> did that read. <laughs> so, right. Um, uh, that would be very hard done. So the only maybe Baradinska essay would be interesting. It's an English but talks about Russian. Um, and uh, as a kind of interesting aspect, I thought I want, just wanted to bring up, um, of course, the, as the project started in 2003, so the historical references obviously are, so some of the contemporaries such as Clinton, Bush, also the September 11th, of course, also, that kind of explains why uh, 
there are all these historical references that maybe are not so clear to the students anymore, but of course the relevant probably still is. Um, other thing that I kind of wanted to point out is this uh, tension in the essays between uh, just the essay and uh, the travelogue. And uh, um, of course, travelogues can be long, right? There can be um, a whole uh, a book about a certain uh, travel, travels, travel memoirs. Um, but also in the Soviet Union, there was a very long tradition of travelogues, and usually they were written as this kind of um, very ideologically skewed. Um, and uh, tried to present America in a particular way, and it was kind of a combination of pr propaganda, but also education, to teach people uh, about different countries, maybe the problems that people face in different countries. Uh, and we have a number of essays uh, that can be seen maybe a little bit as travelogues, but obviously no longer directed ideology. Uh, but also we have essays that are um, very personal and are, are even not so concerned with the real travel, right, the real place of America, but kind of America as a mythology. Um, also, kind of other thing uh, that um, interested me there that uh, with some of those personal essays, they say that they don't want to go and they even say why perhaps they don't need to go because they already know everything about America. Um, and uh, some of the um, themes that uh, that I wanted to bring up, and I think they already came up. Uh, some of them, and maybe some of them, we still can talk a little bit more. Uh, uh, so, America's idea and America is a uh, real geographical location, and I'll talk a little bit more about this. Uh, we see this, uh, again, this contrast in many essays. Uh, also, popular culture. Some of the essays are written, uh, kind of they even tell us how, uh, how American movie is supposed to run, for example. What are the stereotypical American movie? Something like Marina Galina or um, Olga Ilinska, I think, also talks about this. Um, and uh, high culture. And you, some of you mentioned that high culture probably wouldn't be that accessible. But um, as Drew a little bit talked about this, high culture, American high culture was very romanticized by Russian intellectuals. Uh, they saw it as a, a position. And we think, see kind of nostalgia that they feel towards um, this um, high culture that in, in the sometimes feel that maybe they lost some of that romanticism by being exposed to all this popular uh, culture right now. Uh, also, actually, um, the project um, started um, from this kind of discussion how uh, contemporary American po poetry is no longer uh, well, well known among Russian intellectuals. So it used to be uh, American high culture was much more kind of um, current, or knowledge of that culture was much more current. But uh, even in the 2000s, uh, people kind of start, started to lose interest. And that's uh, one of the reasons why this project America has begun. Um, uh, identity and ethnicity, I thought, was uh, interesting, and we saw that in uh, Garlic and <coughs> particularly, uh, where, uh, and a lot of you like this essay, so the real, real American girl 
where she kind of uh, strives towards authenticity, right? One of the ways we can read this essay that, well, she doesn't want to be an immigrant, rather she wants to be a real American girl, and she has her own perceptions of that. Or um, even though she is ambivalent, she sees the attraction towards that idea. And then we see kind of sadness at the end of the essay, um, where it's the life in Russia that um, she somewhat criticizes. Although maybe we don't notice this as much, but she refers to the terrorist attacks um, in Russia at the end of the essay and how the government um, didn't treat this correctly. There's a small footnote about this. Um, and um, also kind of the way that ethnicities are treated in Russia. So the, when nationality has a face, that refers to a kind of the fact that in Russia people say people of uh, uh, people with the face of minor nationality, something like that. Um, uh, and the issue of power, I will talk a little bit more in uh, relation in connection to one particular essay, uh, so Moskva Chelyabinsk's that one. But uh, in general, I think um, issue of power maybe is a kind of subtext to this essay. It's because, as Drew was saying, um, there is this anti-Americanist mood, Amer mood that is created by Putin's government. And the reason for that very often is the desire for Russia to acquire uh, more power, more authority in the world. So there is maybe some tension um, in the essays. Uh, fascination with America, but also uh, sometimes disappointment, uh, maybe um, the intellectuals have to go to America to feel a certain way, like again with Kapkoyuk. So the, um, again, this is the uh, Chevalier of the person who um, I think also didn't go to the U.S. Uh, or said that he doesn't, he, he mentions his, his travels in the West, but doesn't say that, no, he doesn't feel he needs to go to the US. Uh, but actually feels that um, America is more like a psychoanalytical problem. So again, the issues of personal definition, um, <coughs> the definition against somebody else. And of course, you know, this is maybe more true for the intellectuals, but also in popular culture, um, it plays out where um, all these neoconservative groups, they constantly try to um, oppose Russia to the US, try to create this um, binary opposition, maybe something that Said so this Orientalism, there is now the same attention in uh, Russian neoconservative discourses. Um, and again, for them, America became, became the quintessential West. So they're not so much interested in Europe, but in the US. Um, also, I was, uh, but I think we already talked about this, how uh, there are some essays that um, kind of go against this grain of America as uh, either psychoanalysis or some place that you don't need to go to. Uh, some actually see somewhere you need to uh, in going to America. And uh, for example, Unipovich, uh, we talked about Pittsburgh and how pleasantly surprised he was by uh, kind of the orderly celebration of Pittsburgh. And maybe he didn't like Atlanta as much, but he liked Pittsburgh. <laughs> um, and also, kind of this more normal behavior that um, this author didn't expect, but it, it does happen. And also, we do have some essays that go, although you, we did say that it's mostly urban, but still they describe in detail life in the US. 
university towns or Atlanta. Um, and uh, so I will finish with this notion of power and um, Uh, the Babilski essay that uh, Drew will continue talking about, right? or will mention, uh, mention it again. But uh, just kind of um, a very interesting uh, dynamic and unusual, unusual dynamic that we see in this particular essay. Where again, it's not clear whether um, this person even went to the US, but he sees this parallel between. Uh, Moscow and provinces and America and the rest of the world in terms of power relationships. Um, and kind of, he feels that there are much more anti American feelings in Moscow because Moscow tries to be a, a, metropol a metropole in the same way that America tries to be a metropole. And um, he kind of points us towards this. Uh, maybe feelings of some intellectuals who live, still live in the provinces, uh, somewhat disappointed that um, Russia is kind of becoming two different um, states, uh, where Moscow is much more similar to the US, and I think there were a couple of essays that talked about this, the similarity, but the similarities are actually only relevant to Moscow, whereas they're not so relevant to provinces, and that's what he out to so how Moscow controls the left the provinces the same way that America controls the rest of the world.